Good evening. It's Wendy Hernandez. And tonight I have another wonderful guest. I have Daniel Harold. And Daniel is with Divorced over 40.com. And I'm just going to read the about us section from Daniel and his co creators website. And what it says is how we started. Like so many good things, this one started with conversations among a few new friends. Over small dinners and happy hours during the summer of 2020, six 40 somethings in Tulsa realized one striking common denominator their midlife post divorce status. Messy, raw, friendly, acrimonious, you name it. Our experiences or their experiences with divorce and their exes were varied, but all of them sang from the same sheet of, mu sheet of music. Divorce midlife is not for the faint of heart. Themes began to emerge, such as the importance of friendship, managing a new set of finances, self-care and healing, successful co-parenting, and of course, dating. And thus started Divorce Over 40. Follow their journey and yours. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thank you for having me, Wendy. I'm glad to be here. Oh, great. That's wonderful. So, Daniel, um, I'm wondering if, if you can share with the viewers how Divorced Over 40 came to be. And a yeah, little bit about exactly. and a little bit about your, your story. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. Well, um, just I'll yeah, I'll give a little bio of me, me and how this evolved because it's uh, it's actually all still fairly new. So I I was born and raised here in in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, you know the the culture here is much like you know I think the South, uh, much in the South where you know, you tend to get married right out of college, have kids, bam, 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 and start, you know, raising kids and building your career. And I was one of the same. I got married the summer after I graduated from college. I dated my ex-wife uh, for four years through college. And then I had a 22 year marriage, you know, was married at 23, had my first child at 25, had three, three daughters before I turned 30. And, um, you know, 22 years later, we just kind of drifted over the time, the kind of the classic case that a lot of married couples, unfortunately, go through where they just kind of drift and kind of feel like they're roommates. And, you know, many choose to make that divorce decision once the kids were out of the house. But I think we both knew that we weren't happy at all and we didn't want to go through that um, those few extra years. So I got divorced. It was actually. I like to call it, it was the unicorn of a divorce. We, we did everything right. Um, we're very amicable. The whole process was as, as seamless as you could describe it. Although that doesn't discount the fact that you still go this, through the same set of emotions and that we all go through in the divorce, including your kids. So I kind of came out of it on the other side and about 18 months later, um, which was last summer, the, sum, the summer of COVID, um, you know, pretty much my career, travel, uh, as well as my dating life came to a stop. And I kind of looked, kind of, it was an, an opportunity to reflect on myself. And I was like, you know, I really don't have a whole lot of friends at all locally. Uh, matter of fact, I don't have any. And I kind of made a conscious decision at that point that I really needed to invest some time in building my tribe. And I had a coworker in, that was also had just recently gotten divorced and we started hanging out. And next thing you know, we're having cookouts at his house every Thursday uh, evening. And we started to invite people and, you know, it wasn't a divorce party per se, but everybody that came was divorced and they were in their forties and fifties. And, you know, each, time each Thursday, it was a different group of, you know, 10, 15, 20 people. And so my, my friend group really started to expand really rapidly. If, uh, and what I really liked about it, it was all like kinded people. We'd all gone through that one event, which was a divorce. And so it's not that we got in there and we were sharing sob stories, but there's just a connection of, with people that get it. Um, and so, um, I built this friend group, um, amongst six friends, including myself, that was really tightly bonded. And we kind of made fun of each other and, and said, you know, we're kind of the friends of the 40 year, 40 somethings and started an Instagram account, um, decided to all do it just to kind of, it's really more intended to be a self deprecating account to kind of make fun of our lives and just stuff that 40 year old divorcees go through. 
um, well, we decided in our initial post to, to talk about our divorce story. And each one of those was really raw and authentic. And it just resonated with, you know, the friends and family and the audience that um, read it um, so much so that we kind of look back, we were like, I think we're onto something here. I think we can be uh, kind of provide support to this community just based on the feedback that we got. And so, you know, you fast forward nine months later, won't give you all the details, but we've really almost built a worldwide community. We have over 10,000 people that follow wow. us across all of our social channels. We have um, well over 53 cities that are starting communities just like we did in Tulsa. I kind of call it the copy and paste. So we have leaders that have raised their hand and said, I want to do exactly what you did in Tulsa in building a tribe and a social network of divorced men and women in my city. We have 53 cities and 77 leaders who are building um, divorce over 40 communities across the world. So um, it, it's turned out what was originally just supposed to be kind of fun and lighthearted ended up having a much greater meaning and impact for the people that we touch. That's, uh, that's amazing work that you're doing, Daniel. And, you know, I think that one of the fears that I hear often from people who are considering divorce is the fear of losing friends, you know, who, who may have been friends of the couple or family, like, you know, you were married for 22 years and, you know, I don't know, but I'm guessing that her family had become your family. So, you know, there's this fear of losing the support network that people have, you know, and especially when there's kids involved, you know, and you know, it takes a village to raise kids and you lose half your support network or you lose friends and maybe that support network isn't going to be here. And I venture to say a lot of people stay out of fear of not having that support. What would you say to somebody who's struggling with that? Well, I would say that I empathize with that because, uh, you know, like many people describe divorce as a death and it's not only the death of a relation, a long-term relationship often with your spouse, but it's a death amongst fr uh, family members on the other side, your in-laws, some of which, you know, I think my, my mother-in-law, my ex-mother-in-law, was probably my biggest cheerleader throughout the 22 year marriage. Um, you know, people that you love dearly, um, you start to drift, you know, you may still keep in touch, but you start to drift. So it's much like a death there. And then, you know, the friends is that's the awkward piece of it. It's like, you know, who do you reach out to, to, to provide sympathy to, and who do you hang out with and who do you invite? And so as a result, a lot of friends just don't do anything you know, they just kind of stay silent and you lose those friendships. And so in many ways um, you are having to start over. But I will tell you that I'm not a big advocate for divorcing. If, you know, if you haven't expended all of your efforts to try to make it work, mm -hmm. um, but there is the stories that we tell um, are such that we all have gone through that experience, those feelings that someone that's thinking about it and is scared of is going into. We've all experienced that. And in many cases, the one, the stories that we're telling is there is light on the other side. There are meaningful relationships and friendships. I have more friends than I've ever had in my lifetime. And so there's just a lot of positives there um, to, to have come from a divorce because it's much like a rebirth. You kind of have to retrain, mm -hmm. retool and start over and do a lot of things new. For, so for some people that's really, really scary and for other people, that's really, really exciting too. It's like, I've got a new chapter that I can write for myself. Yeah. I like how you um, characterize that as rebirth. Um, I think like a lot of times, especially if a person's not the one who wants the divorce, um, they are really, I mean, it is a death. Like you said, it's the death of a relationship, but people often can't see behind or beyond that death part to Hey, maybe something better is beyond the death. Yeah. So even, I, go ahead. I like to equate it. I equate it to a storm, like in, in, on the sea. And when you're right in the middle of the storm and the waves are raging, you're you're not thinking about the horizon and the fact that the sun's going to come out. You know, the next day, you're just trying to harness in and survive the storm. And so, 
you know, I think much like many divorces, when you're going through all your stuff, particularly if it's a high conflict divorce, or even if it's not just the emotions that you feel, the shame, the embarrassment, um, the self-worth, the loneliness, all those emotions that are occurring, you're going through this storm and it's really hard to kind of lift your head up and look for the, uh, look for the sun on the horizon. So, you know, it sounds like you and your ex-wife, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong or help clarify. I mean, did you both want the divorce that you got? Um, I did not want it. So, and, and I don't think she wanted it too, but I think that she, her energy was so spent on, you know, trying to repair the divorce in, in her own way. Um, and that I think that she just finally kind of threw in the towel and, um, you know, she asked me, uh, at some point, Hey, look, we're both like roommates here living together. We're both incredibly miserable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that it would be best if you moved out and, um, let's just see how we feel about that experience separating. And, you know, I was like many men, you know, failure, uh, in a divorce is not an option. Men just don't like to fail. It's like innately built into us where we, we hate losing. And, you know, I, we came from parents that were married over 50 years in both cases. And so uh, that's not to say that divorce didn't occur in our extended family. But um, for me, I guess my mentality subconsciously, now that I've reflected back was, you know, I made this bed, I got to lay in it. And if I'm just going to be unhappy the rest of my life, then I'm going to be unhappy the rest of my life. And um, it wasn't until, you know, several weeks after we had that conversation that, you know, sh the conversation kept coming up and up and up that um, I decided, you know, this probably is in the best interest for me to move out. And I think it was funny because, again, we, we had a pretty good, uh, pretty amicable split. And about two weeks after I'd moved out, I called her we were talking about kids or something, coordinating something. And I, I said, Hey, how are you? And she goes, you know, I'm actually remarkably okay. And I said, I am too. And mm -hmm. it was just freeing to know that, um, look, it was, it's not, you know, I, I just, I had a lot of guilt at the time and it was just, it really took that albatross off my back to say, okay, this, this might work out. And of course here I am two and a half years later, I am happy with the decision. I don't regret it. I don't think she does. Yeah. And I'm so excited about the future of my life. That's that's wonderful that you guys were able to reach that point. So I, I come across a lot of people, a lot of viewers and a lot of clients and potential clients who are um, just like you described in a marriage, unhappy, just overall unhappy, but they, like you, feel like I made this bed. I got a lie in it despite the fact that they're miserable, they're staying together because there's kids in the picture. It could be some sort of spiritual or religious belief or yes. fear of fear of disappointing parents or family. What wisdom would you share to those people who are feeling so unhappy um, yet they're staying in the marriage just really because of this other external reason? Well, you ha I think at the end of the day, you have to do what's right for yourself and you have to consider your overall happiness and, you know, being 45, when I got divorced, I have my whole life ahead of me. And mm -hmm. so even though you're middle aged, you can't just assume, well, I'm coming down in the latter years and maybe I can just grin and bear it. I mean, there's a whole life to live ahead of you. And when you rather choose to be happy and frankly speaking, your kids are very intuitive. They're smart. They know that you're unhappy. And in fact, it probably makes them more unhappy and more anxious and sad because you're unhappy as a person. And so I think that the health of your kids, regardless of what age, whether they're, you know, still in elementary school, middle school, graduation, or even left, I think is a lot better if they have two ha happy and healthy parents, even if they live separately together than very unhappy parents living together. So um, I get it. I was there and I really struggled with it for all the reasons that you described, but, um, you know, I think I did what's best for me at the end of the day, and I don't regret it. Okay, got it. So I, you know, I agree with you. I was, you know, I'm raised, well, I'm raised by people who are born, you know, married over 50 years, a Catholic upbringing, and I'm happily married. But the bottom line is, is I think that 
if I were in a relationship that made me unhappy and it just, we couldn't repair it through counseling or therapy, or if I was a victim of, of abuse, ultimately I would get out. That's what I think. And I'm not telling people to do that, but I think they need to explore, you know, um, therapy or counseling or with somebody of faith, um, to, to we, do. Can, we put so much internal shame on ourselves. It's not really outwardly pressure. Yeah. I think I think it's really just ourselves. We put this guilt and this shame on ourselves that we're a failure, that we've lost, that we're, you know, destroying a family. And it took a time, it took a while to work through that myself. And I, I'm working through it, just getting validation from family that, you know, it, it's okay. I remember real early on when I was separated, I had breakfast with my dad and mom and my dad asked me how I was doing. And I just felt like I was disappointing my dad. Mm. And I just started crying. I was kind of opening my heart and my dad said, you know what? He goes, um, I forgave you the minute that you told me that you were leaving her mm. and that you were separating. And it was just like, I mean, thank God that I had a father like that, that was, yeah. that, you know, wasn't judgmental and didn't share offer his opinion. But, you know, a lot of that is, it wasn't really him. It was me putting it on myself. And I think we just have to somehow get rid of that internal pressure that we're failures just because we can't make a bad thing good. Yep. I got it. So it, it seems like to me, Daniel, like you've done a lot of reflecting since your divorce and, and I, you know, so you described your journey and so you and your wife, ex-wife separate. And then now here you are divorced over 40 and have a bunch of friends and stuff. Well, what happened in between? Well, what happened in between was the work and it, it was, uh, it was kind of a self journey in itself. And I've had that question before. And someone asked me, what would you have done differently during that 18 months that you um, hadn't found your friends? And, you know, there wasn't probably a whole lot of things differently. I would have been a little bit smarter in my dating. Um, I learned, I've made some missteps along the way. Um, you know, I probably would have seek counseling. I chose not to do that. Um, and so I kind of worked through, I, you know, what wasn't reading books. I wasn't, uh, I just had a lot of alone time. You know, I'm an introvert by nature. Mm. And so being alone, I, I didn't really experience too much of the loneliness aspect, but being alone um, allowed me to just kind of reflect. And I always went into it never pointing fingers. I think that's a big piece of it. I think that bitterness and that resentment um, really hurts and prolongs the healing process. When in fact, maybe you should maybe look at what you need to work on, maybe where you failed in the marriage, not saying that everybody does, but um, I felt like I had that approach when I thought about all of these things. And really, I, you know, it was just a lot of kind of alone time and going through, um, going through myself and, you know, and when I, when divorce over 40 started, it really created a platform for me to now put everything that I worked through on paper mm -hmm. and I love writing. I never knew that I love writing, but I love it, especially when it's short. Um, yeah. And so it's created this opportunity for me to talk about so many different things and just try to impart a little bit of wisdom of, of, you know, how a man felt and what a guy went through during the divorce. So a lot of it was just me working through it versus getting help specifically. Um, or, you know, I will say this, I did, I was religious in exercise, yoga mm -hmm. and I exercised every day. And, and my mentality was, well, at least there's one thing that I can feel good about myself is that I'm in the best shape of my life. And I really got mm -hmm. to be in the best shape of my life. And yoga really allowed me to kind of just kind of decompress and slow down and, and um, so those two things right out of the gate um, were incredibly helpful. And that's hard to do if you get depressed to have the desire to go work out. And so, and I was depressed, um, but mm. I just kind of forced myself to, to do that. And that was something that kind of kept my spirits high. Um, so it seems, you know, and I think that everybody has their own way of processing loss that's effective. And so the right, I'm hearing that the writing and the yoga were two big pieces for you. Very big. Yes. Okay. Um, and those moments when you felt really lonely or when you felt 
really depressed because people go through this and yeah. you know i've been through it not in the context of a divorce but a relationship loss that was very difficult so what what would you say to people when they're in that moment you know and they feel hopeless they feel unlovable they feel unworthy and they don't know if they're going to feel happy again well this is where i think i didn't actually add this point if i had done that all over again I would have really focused a lot of my energy in finding a group of friends mm -hmm. and that's what I lacked. And I think that when you go through those, that those, when you go through those types of emotions, that's where that tribe can help you. Even if it's just merely to just distract yourself by being a little bit social. But if you do feel, have those feelings, at least having friends that have gone through the exact same thing or are going through the exact same thing at this exact same time, is is very therapeutic and i've seen that just in the community as we're growing that there's all different stages of people in different lives there's people that are just about to get divorced and then they've just moved out and they're in the middle of the divorce process which as you know can take you know months or years and years mm -hmm. uh, there's people that are 10 years out of it and still struggling through their own issues and you know just you know finding that tribe of like-minded people they've all gone through that one event which is a divorce um, can be incredibly um, therapeutic, can give you a sense of purpose. You've got your support group. Sometimes you don't want to be as open and candid about these type of issues with your family. You know, these aren't things that I talk to my brother about um, or my mom for that matter. And so it gives you kind of an avenue to be candid and open with, you know, people that are going to be sympathetic to it and are going to say, yeah, I've been through that. And not maybe not necessarily going to try to offer you any advice as a result, just, just there to listen. So I think finding your tribe um, is really important and it's hard Wendy, because you lose all your friends. A lot of times when you're going through this for the reasons we described and you're like, okay, how do I rediscover new friends? Where am I going to go to find friends? Mm -hmm. And that's where this idea of this divorce over 40 kind of was born that, Gosh, we're going to, we can create a platform where you can just plug in. All you have to do is show up. There mm -hmm. are people there that are, that are your age, same stage of life, going through the same exact issues. All you have to do is show up. We make it really easy so that you don't have to try to find an avenue or an outlet to go find friends when you're struggling. And so yeah. that's, that's something that I think really could benefit someone as they're going through all of those um, emotions that you described. Yes, I agree. And so the, I, I posted a comment here. Kathy Michaels says having no one is so very hard. And she says nine years later, I'm finally finding them. They understand it's been a long road. You know, and Kathy is a friend of mine. I asked her to come on and, and, and listen. I'm glad she's here. And she uh, lives up in Kansas and she came down for a big event two weeks ago uh, in Tulsa that we had for with our group. And I loved watching her because I know that she's just like all of us has gone through a tough time and to see her connecting with all of these virtual friends that she's now meeting in person and taking photos with all the ladies and the men. And I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's really giving you a sense of purpose when you find those friendships. Yeah, totally. And I think um, by and large, when people come to see me, they feel like life is over, you know, that there's nothing after the force that is just, over and that it's nothing but darkness afterwards. Can you paint a picture for us of what is possible after divorce, even in midlife? You know, um, I can, because like I said, let's use that storm analogy. You know, they come to you and they feel like life is over is because they're right in the middle of the storm and all they see are these, you know, 60 foot waves that are beating up against them. Um, but when you connect with people that have gone through the divorce and they've come out on the other side, I can tell people that are in the middle of the waves that if you just hang on a little bit longer, yeah. the sun's going to come out. And, you know, as I described, if you embrace it, once you kind of get through your healing process and you, you know, what I, I call, I call there's a period of time where I believe you can rediscover yourself. It's like a rebirth. It's looking back at all of those hobbies and passions that, you might have shelved because of your marriage and being able to dust those off. Or maybe there's new hobbies, new things that you want to do. Maybe you want to be braver and more social 
and you can kind of just do a reset. And if you embrace that, um, it can be really exciting about, you know, for example, you know, one of the things that I decided this year um, was number one, to travel alone. I've never done that. And um, number two is to go climb a big mountain. And so in October, mm -hmm. I'm climbing Kilimanjaro in Africa. Wow. Oh, that's and, awesome. You know, I've never climbed a mountain before, but, <laughs> but it's one of those where I would have never thought of doing that uh, in my marriage. My ex wouldn't have done that with me. Um, yeah. That wasn't, but it, for me, it was like, you know what, I'm going to do something that's just like, you know, it's just going to be a big, hairy, audacious, audacious goal. You know, something like, I almost kind of see that as my chapter turn, so to speak, is to climb that mountain. And I just think that, I really think it's a blank canvas for a lot of people. Um, we could, well, I always reference blank canvas, next chapter, and it's for you to write. You're the yeah. artist, you're the writer. And you can either sulk in your divorce and you can prolong that painful process and be kind of a miserable person and you're going to attract miserable people as a, as a result. Mm -hmm. Or you can say, you know what, this is a restart for me and I'm going to, I'm going to make the best of it. And you can have a fruitful life ahead of you. So thank you for that. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you for that. So can you talk a little bit about um, something you just said, which is you can be miserable and attract miserable people expand on what you mean well, by that. Yeah. I mean, I think you are what you attract. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, that particularly holds uh, true in your dating. I think that, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you go into dating, which is a whole new animal, that could be a whole other discussion, Wendy, we can yes. talk hours for that. But if you go into dating with a bad attitude and um, you don't not trusting and, you know, taking some bad experiences that you've had in the past and apply it to everyone. Well, guess what? You're going to have a miserable experience. You're going to turn off the good guys because yep. they're going to see there's this unhappy woman that I don't want to hang out with her. All she talks about is their bad dating experiences. Uh. So I, re I really think you are what you attract. And I think that if you have a positive attitude and in whatever prospect in life, yeah, you know, I'm not, you know, a lot of people get um, demoralized because of the financial situation that they're in on the other side. A lot of people get disenfranchised with dating. A lot of people get disenfranchised with um, having to start a brand new career when maybe you were the, uh, the provider at the home. I mean, there's, it's all about perspective. Um, you know, I built the big house and I did the big things and I kept up with Joneses and behind me, I'm in an 800 square foot apartment with, you know, used furniture and I'm happier than I've ever been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's all about perspective. So it's, I think it is all about your attitude and you, you can't change that attitude unless you get through the healing. You got to work on yourself. You got to get through that pain. And, and then it's an opportunity for you to then make that decision. Am I going to make the best of it or am I going to just live the status quo? Mm -hmm. So uh when it comes to shifting your mindset, shifting your perception, I feel like for so many people, they are so entrenched in that negativity or feeling like, um, well, just the negativity that it's hard to get out of it. Like they may shift it for 10 minutes or they may shift it for a day or they may shift it for a week. And then it's right back to the old mindset, right back to the old habits. Do you have any tips or thoughts on maintaining a you know, maintaining that new mindset. Yeah, you probably need to, you know, I always tell people if you just are so disenfranchised with dating because you're always having bad experiences, then stop dating. Mm. You know, just get off the apps mm -hmm. and work on yourself or go do something else that's fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think it's maybe changing the behaviors that you're doing. That's, that's, you know, bringing those emotions, those negative emotions that you're having, um, yeah. you know, and I can't speak to co-parenting. I have a good relationship with my ex, so I don't have those issues, but a lot of it, you know, could be uh, the frequency or the level in which you communicate with your ex spouse. If every time they trigger you, well then stop communicating with them or communicate only as needed, you yeah. know? And so I think a lot of people keep going into those same patterns where they just get triggered and things have negative emotions and a negative attitude and you just have to stop that behavior. And, you know, it's okay to be single. Um, it's okay to not date in your forties or fifties for that matter. Um, it's okay to focus on friendships or to focus on you or to focus on your career. Um, 
And so, you know, you don't have to fall into the stream of what everybody else is doing, especially if it's making you unhappy. Yeah. Okay. So I have a question from Safe Haven. Safe Haven says, where do I meet those wonderful men? Three years later and still high conflict. How can you stay positive as you have no energy or finances to defend against false accusations? Any thoughts on that? I mean, there's a lot underneath well, that. I don't know if I can answer the, the last part because I'm sure I, I haven't experienced that. Um, you know, by and large, I have a really good relationship with my, with my ex-spouse. So I feel it for you. I think having your tribe of friends <clears throat> can help maybe soften those blows every, every time that you get punched, you know, your friends don't want you always call on them whenever you, you know, to, to uh, kind of vomit all over them, but just, you know, focusing on friendships, I think can keep you distracted from maybe some of those things. But as far as the wonderful man, how do you, how do you meet them? They're out there. They are out there as much as people are disenfranchised with the forties and 50 year old men that are out there and all the bad behaviors that you hear about, there are really good men with good intentions. Um, and I think you can find that through dating. And I think that you can find that through Divorced Over 40, the community that we've built. And the nice thing about the community that we've built is we've prefaced it as we're not a dating site. So the social activities that we have, you're coming to, to meet and network with like-kinded people to build friendships. If you're coming to try to get a phone number or to find someone to ask on a date, please don't come. Mm -hmm. Not with that intention. And what's that's not to say that relationships don't organically occur, but we all want or, or be, or organic relationships to occur, right? And wouldn't you rather have an organic relationship to occur on a foundation of friendship? Yeah. Um, but it just going into those type of event, events, I think, lets your guard down and you feel comfortable and more natural with who you are and being yourself. And so do the men and you yeah. can start to foster good friendships with both men and women. I have just as many women friends as I do men. And um, I think it's healthy. And I think that's where you're going to find good men. Honestly, I think even through the dating apps, there's a way to do that as well. That would take a whole other series, but you just yeah. have, it's all about positivity and staying positive. Yeah. You know, there's good men out there. People have raised good sons, even our age. They're out there. <laughs> they may be hurting. They may be going through their their painful journey, but they'll come out on the other side and, and you'll find them. Just be patient, stay positive and, and keep your filter tight. You know, be picky and choosy with who you pick, you choose to be with. Oh, that's like, that's such great advice, such fantastic advice. Um, you know, and, and we've all heard forever that there's no good men left or no good women left. I mean, we've heard it forever, but we all know some good men and we all know some good women and you just confirm that they're still good men so and there's great women and yeah. it's just you know you got to navigate through it and again everybody's at a different stage in their journey and so sometimes you might find a guy that's going through a lot of his pain and so he may be doing a, he may be making a lot of bad decisions as a result of the pain that he's going through that doesn't mean he's a bad person Mm -hmm. He's just going through that. And you know what? Two, three, four years down the road, or even less than that, when he goes through that process, he rediscovers himself. You know, he probably would look back and say, I wish I hadn't have made those decisions. You still have a, you now have a good guy that's got a lot of self reflection. So, that's right. Um, you know, not all the bad guys are really bad. I think a lot of them <laughs> are making poor decisions because they're in pain and they're angry and they're frustrated. And, that's all kind of bringing out to making bad choices. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, totally agree with that. You know, do you think there's value when in dating, you know, cause I, I'm just thinking about my youth and dating and always thinking, is this guy the one? Like, I wanna get married, I wanna settle down, blah, blah, blah. And then at some point I had a shift in perspective and it was just, I, I'm just gonna date for fun, you know? Do you have thoughts on that? <laughs> I am a huge, huge advocate on dating for fun. Mm -hmm. And I, my biggest, you know, when it comes to dating advice, if I'm asked to give it, it's to go into every dating oper dating event or occurrence as an opportunity to make a friend. Mm -hmm. Don't look at every date as, will this be the one? And um, what do I need to, need to do to make sure that he's attracted to me? Mm -hmm. Go in saying, you know, with just the expectation that, you know what, 
this person was interesting enough for me to say yes to his proposal to go out or for me to ask her out, whichever side you're on. Yeah, I found him interesting. I found him attractive or her attractive. And I'm going to go and try to just cultivate a friendship and just mm -hmm. work on that foundationally. And it takes so much of the pressure off. Too many mm -hmm. people are putting too much pressure on themselves, particularly mm -hmm. in our 40s and 50s, because we feel like the clock's running out. Right. And uh, or we feel we need to latch on to someone because culturally we look weird if we're single and we just need to swim upstream to that um, that viewpoint and just date to make friends. I have so many friends from my dating experiences because I handled it the right way. I was open and transparent with where I was in my journey. And I've met a lot of incredibly fascinating women, many of which are now in my community mm -hmm. and participating because they're passionate about um, wanting to cultivate friendships. And so I agree with you. I think that's the best way to handle dating. I, I love it. You know, and I can tell you for, for me too, this was way back, way back before internet dating. And uh, at some point I decided, well, I'm going to try a dating service. And I tried, it's just lunch. Have you heard of that? You know, I have, I do remember the name of that. <laughs> so long ago. And so I, you know, so with this just lunch, they would, you pay money and they would set you on a certain number of dates, send you on a certain number of dates uh, per month, you know, for a year contract. And so I went into it with the attitude that I'm just going to have fun. And the thing that it did for me, like I didn't meet the guy I ended up with, but it helped with confidence. Yes. Yeah. You get reps, right? You get repetition. Yeah. yeah. You learn how to, you know, you, and also I think that if you, um, most people as they cultivate friendships, they become curious about that person. And so if you have a natural curiosity when you go into a day because you want to cultivate a friendship, well, guess what? You're going to ask a lot of questions. Yeah. You're going to talk less and ask more about them and their career and their hobbies and their passions and their family and their kids. Then you are going to talk about yourself. And that's great practice. Yeah. Women yeah. love, uh, you know, from a male perspective, women love it when you've got an engaging man that is interested in them versus some, a guy that's bloviating about, everything that he's accomplished, you know, that's just a big turnoff. So it does give you a lot of really good reps, you know, almost to a fault. You can get really good at it, you know? Yeah. Um, but I do think that it really helps you to kind of develop that skill set of being interested in people, of talking about yourself, of knowing when brevity is probably good versus saying too much. You just kind of learn through trial and error. Yeah. It is so true. And, and everybody's interesting, you know, it's, just, everybody has a story. And, um, you know, I think when I shifted my attitude to one of, you know, I just want to hear this person's story and be interested. It just, yeah. it really got interesting for me. <laughs> yeah. And everybody, you're right. And, you know, especially when you date in, um, divorced men and women, because, you know, they've got a long life and many times there's, you know, you hear if you really dive into kind of the shit that everybody goes through, which we all go through our own storms and seeing people come out on the other side and how, you know, I just learned how resilient and strong women are. Mm -hmm. I, I became, you know, I have three girls. So I've always been pretty, you know, always favored and been good with, with uh, women, but just hearing those stories of, you know, overcoming obstacles or, re, you know, refocusing on a career and, you know, all of those things fascinate me. And I think that, um, yeah, I think we just need to be more, you know, curious and engaging from that perspective. And, you know, I think that you'll really um, cultivate a lot of friendships and, and become really good at just engaging with people in general. Yep. Great advice. So, so Daniel, I think like you've confirmed that there is life after midlife divorce. Great life, Wendy, great life. <laughs> and people can be just joyous and happy and have tons of friends and just, like you said, it can be a great life. So how can you help people? How can they well, find you? Well, I think there's two ways. Number one is, um, you know, get plugged in. If you go to our website, we, the, the most commonly asked question we get is, do you have a community that's growing in fill in the city, Austin, Boston, New York, Atlanta? And so we got that question so much that we have a form um, that you can go to. It's called, if you go to divorce, 
over 40.com and you go to find your tribe. It's at the top. There's a form that you fill out. It says, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey. You know, I'm looking for my tribe. And then we have 77 leaders. We call them city ambassadors across 53 states that um, if you happen to be in that city, we'll plug you in. We'll forward your contact information. They'll reach out. We've got ongoing happy hours and events that are already occurring on many of these communities. If um, we also have leadership opportunities because we've had so many strong men and women, e even if they're not type A personalities, but maybe type B that say, gosh, darn it, I'm going to start it because I want this for my city. Yeah. We've had so many brave men and women that have really kind of gotten out of their comfort zone, kind of that resetting mm -hmm. and said, I'm going to lead efforts. And so we've got information that we can send you about what does it mean to be a city ambassador? It's such a unique, we had a big dinner two weeks ago and we had about, I think about 10 to 12 city ambassadors from Milwaukee and Chicago and Cincinnati and Houston come to Tulsa. And it's like this inner circle of we're mm. such good friends. It's so fun. Yeah. So you can be a part of that, the leadership team. And basically you're like our cheerleader in your city. You're coordinating the activities. As people find out about us, we plug them into you and you kind of get them involved. And so that's another way to get involved in our community as well. That's awesome. So I highly encourage if, you know, find the, the tribe in your city. And if there isn't one, then start one. Exactly. We haven't yeah. started up two to three times a week, new people <laughs> pop up. So Lily is saying, Daniel seems like a great, great man. Is he single? Asking. That's a well, nice compliment. <laughs> that is a nice compliment. And I'll, I'll gladly answer that, Lily. So the funny thing is, I am dating someone and I met her at one of our events. Oh. And I wasn't looking. I was. I met her and we became friends and we started dating. And so I think that you can meet people organically at some of these events. And there's going to be connections that happen. I'm living proof of that. Oh, that's great, you guys. So don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. You know, whether you're just going through the divorce now or it's been years, like safe haven, there there is hope for you. But you got to take some steps maybe that you're not used to taking. Would you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Be brave and be bold. That's right. Take risks. Like that's the only way we grow is taking risks. I agree. So, so that's awesome. Daniel, thank you so much for spending some time with me this evening. And I can't wait to hear how your tribe grows and hear more about it. And um, let me know if there's anything else that I can do in the future. Well, thank you for thank you for what you do for the divorce community, because I think your program and bringing on guests and the things that you do bring a beacon of light and hope to people as well. So I, I appreciate that. And thanks for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. And so for anybody watching this, if you like this episode, first of all, go file or find Daniel at divorced over 40.com. That's number one. Number two is give us a thumbs up here on YouTube. And number three, subscribe to the channel. And then um, I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, remember to keep on trucking and get out there and command the courtroom. And I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.